<laughs> Welcome to MSP Unplugged, episode 46, Into the Sunset. I am your host, Paco LeBron. This is our live show where we discuss different ways to run your IT business, whether it's managed services, consulting, break fix, or anything in between. I can't go into this without mentioning the great event that me and Jeff Hellish, who is not in the episode today, are hosting in September 17th, or I should say on, on September 17th through the 19th in Rosemont, basically in Chicago, TechCon Unplugged 2021. Uh, for those that had went to our 2019 event, it was a great event where everyone was able to get together, learn a lot of great things, and it was a just a great time all around. Uh, but what can you go and get from this time around? Uh, me and Jeff are hard at work to make sure that you can get a lot of great information, learn from amazing panels to help maintain and improve your business. We're working on a great list of vendors to find products and services that can help save you time and money, which we have a few of them that have already signed. Um, we are working with Matt over at Tech Marketing Engine to update the website. And more importantly, rub elbows with your peers in the community. I think a lot of us are really just anxious to get into back into somewhat of a new normal to talk with your fellow peers, rub, rub elbows, um, because we can't really shake hands or hug or anything like that anytime soon, probably. But rub elbows with your peers in the community. So if you are interested, again, we are at the beautiful Aloft Hotel in Rosemont, Illinois. Um, as we mentioned before, the event, we make it as convenient as possible. And that's what we have in mind is how do we make it the it the most convenient for our audience. So your food, your um, entertainment, all of the information included in the event for the price of $199. So we will make sure that you have free parking. The hotel um, is at a discounted rate at 124 a night, which is pretty rare-ish to get free parking with a good rate in the Chicagoland area. Um, we're not really in inside of Chicago, but the reason why we pick Rosemont is it's about a five minute shuttle ride from the Air O'Hare airport right into the system. And from my understanding, starting in the beginning of this year, Southwest will be flying into O'Hare as well. So for those that are Southwest flyers, there's a chance that if everything is goes as well, you'll be able to fly into O'Hare, ride in with your favorite airline, get into the shuttle, get to the hotel. Or if you're driving up for those that are in the Midwest or can drive up, we have that free parking that's available for you as well. So we're working on some additional items for you as well um, to make it as convenient as possible to get to the event. But if you're interested, head over to techconunplugged.com and go ahead and purchase your ticket. Um, again, basically with all the regulations and restrictions, you know, we have a limited amount of capacity that we can fill this uh, space up. Once we hit that space, you'll be in a waiting list. If things open up, we'll be able to include those in. Same thing goes for those that are potentially waiting until later in the end of the year to see if they want to um, go into uh, getting into the event. My suggestion, purchase your ticket now. We do have the safeguard where if there is a restriction or a federal lockdown or anything in between, or if it's about around September-ish and you're still not comfortable on coming in to meet with other people, you know, we'll make sure we take care of you as well if you purchased your ticket. So again, techconunplug.com, feel free to go ahead uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. Two big things about that. Rosemont's a great location, just especially if you're driving and that hotel looks awesome. You did a great job of picking that one out. Yeah, that was a, that was a good find. That was in my, my search of being bent on bringing it back to Chicago in some way, shape or form. Um, but also providing the convenience of travel and consideration for our guests for, you know, monetary and especially in these hard times, too. We wanted to make sure we can throw it as best as possible, as cost effective as possible. But also, you know, we're not losing our shirt trying to do it either. So we're not making money off the event. It's just that's the cost to throw the event. Really, it is so. Well, even with this, uh, the show topic today, I'm still going to plan it on be there. Tickets already purchased. So. And for those that are listening to the audio, that is our good friend of the MSP show, John Dubinsky, formerly of the Maven Group. John, how are you doing? Hey, Paco, I'll get you five by five. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Great to have you. So we will go into a little bit more on what the heck does that mean? What has John been up to um, since we've last talked to him and really go into 
kind of the I think this is a big topic that's been happening in the industry right now is mergers and acquisitions. And it's a really great topic for us to discuss because one, for those that are familiar with the community, we all know John, we've met John in many of the conferences. So it's really good to be able to pick his brain, understand kind of what that process was from his personal experience and really just understanding for those that are interested in doing something like that um, that he was able to achieve. So, but before we get into all that, you know, as we always start off with, we have our tips and stories section. John, I know you got a couple of things for us. Why don't you go ahead and uh, shoot them out? Ah, two quick fun tips, I think. Um, dumpster fire. So if you haven't heard of dumpster fire, this is a fun little site uh, for your end of 2020 or beginning of 2021 catharsis. Um, if you don't know what that means, you can look it up, but uh, I had to, to get the exact definition, but uh, the cool thing about Dumpster Fire is it's a page where you can send an email to dumpsterfire at hey.com. And perhaps maybe you had something in 2020 that you want to find some relief over. What they will do is actually physically print an email that you can see on the screen. It will run up a ramp and then dive into a dumpster and catch on fire. And you can watch this whole thing happen live. I mean, they're a little backed up right now. I think they have like 30,000 emails and they're back up. But I'll put a link in the show notes for that. But I thought that was a lot of love, uh, fun there. So if you want to either send somebody a little love, you know, I sent the message that uh, burn, Paco burn. So I'm hoping to see that roll by. You get notified when your message is going to go up the ramp. So <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. and might be a lot of fun if you have some 2020 memories you want to flush or uh, maybe in something 2021 you want to add to your resolution list. Uh, and kind of in the same realm of that, um, not that I would want anybody to ever not listen to the MSP Unplugged podcast first, but the company that is doing Dumpster Fire is Basecamp. I don't know if you've ever heard of Basecamp, but uh, they're a project management software, which I think is actually a pretty nice product. But uh, you can also check out their podcast called the Rework Podcast. And what I like about the Rework Podcast, and I still listen to it to this day, this is just a great show about maybe a better way to work, uh, giving you ideas on different ways to do things, how to make it not so crazy in the office, uh, maybe different thoughts or philosophies on what you're doing in the office. And it is technology based because they are a technology based company. So that is the Rework podcast at Rework.fm. And those are my two quick tips. Very cool. Very cool. Um, over on my side, really, I don't have any tips or stories, but I have two good books that I think uh, that I've been listening to on Audible. Um, and for those that don't know what Audible is, it's the audiobooks that you can purchase over on Amazon for a monthly subscription, or you can purchase the books outright as well on audio format. <clears throat> Basically, uh, the two books that I have been listening to, I just finished the one from They Ask You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. And basically, the premise of that book is you imp you put out as much content marketing as possible to answer all of the questions that come in to your business, whether that is from a prospecting aspect, whether that's from your customer base, et cetera. And then you utilize that content in your everyday strategies from everywhere, anywhere from marketing to education to your customers on how to do something down to sales, which will allow you to prep your client as you're trying to qualify them and see if they're a good fit so that they're better educated to purchasing IT support services. Because as we all know, a lot of the clients or prospects that we talk to sometimes just don't know what they need or the names or the jargon that we speak. So this will allow you to not only be able to explain it in a more in-depth way outside of an hour call, and it's at the uh, potential prospect's own time frame. So when he does come to the call, that video technically should have done a majority of the education slash selling. And you just go into the nitty gritty and kind of go over on an overview of that. So um, that was a great audio book. <clears throat> it was about an eight hour listen um, on just one one times because I'm still a slow listener. But um, I'm sure you can get faster with one and a half or two or even two and a half like Dora does over at Podnuts, which I still don't understand how he does that. But um, and then the second one, which I'm listening to is called Get a Grip. And that is by Gino Wickman. So essentially what this book is about is. It is based on the original book called Traction. And the theory is that there is a, all businesses are the machines like a Windows PC and they need an operating system 
to run it. So the operating system in this book is called the Entrepreneurial Operating System or EOS. And what is told in traction is how you implement this entrepreneurial operating system. So this is the book that first came out and then Get a Grip came out afterwards where it's a story that narrates the author coming in and actually, I believe it's the author, um, or a representative of that organization to educate this company on how to get back on track because they're experiencing some really dire straits and, and hard times right now. And how do they get back on track? So um, when I was in a mastermind group not so long ago, they would mention these two books and they said that you want to listen to Get a Grip first because it helps provide you an, a high level overview of what traction does and then read the book traction afterwards. So that's kind of the route that I am taking. So far, it's a really great book. Um, just again, it really just talks about, you know, seats of a business, how to operate, things of that nature for those that are looking to scale. And then really to, for those that are one man shops, how to structure yourself so that you are able to scale if you want to, or scale in your own automations to be able to get to where you need to do for your, uh, clients and for your potential prospects as well. So great list so far. I'm about midway through that one. Um, and then the next one will be traction after that. So we'll make sure we have all those in the show notes, um, but can not suggest more on those two books, especially the um, they ask you answer. Um, Remy Bell over at Tech Marketing Engine is a huge proponent of that book. So for any chats, feel free to go jump over in their Facebook group to talk a little bit more about that. So all right, so we're going to jump into the main topic, which is off into the sunsets. And really, this is more of a discussion on not only John's experience, but really on how to discuss about selling your business. And that's what this whole fancy term of merge and acquisition, M&A, that you've been seeing around in a lot of the Facebook groups is how, how do you even go through all that? What? How does it even look like? How does it feel like? And what does it feel like after the fact, right? So, you know, as, <coughs> excuse me, as John has mentioned in previous, he has been in business for well over 20 years doing this for a long time, um, nuts and bolts, but I'll let him kind of go into a little bit about his little origin story for those that haven't heard um, about John in the past. And then we'll just kind of dive into kind of how this all started where, you know, it was, John Davinsky of the Maven Group to John Davinsky, formerly of the Maven Group, or as he has in his tagline in the show, unemployable. Unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paco. Um, you know, so before I start, I'm going to get a little personal here. Before I start my personal story is I would suggest the way I sold my business and the way this came about is totally non-typical. Um, you know, I would uh, suggest that it does not happen this way and certainly does not happen this quickly most of the time. Um, and the reason I got so lucky is some of the personal relationships that I get into that are involved in how I sold my business. But, um, you know, I, I guess this would all start on June 1st. You know, we're, we're right into the thick of the pandemic, all this kind of stuff. And if I look into the background, there's some personal things happening within my entire family as far as some other people, brothers, sisters, making some moves to different locations to be closer to some family that might have some health issues, so on and so forth. So... And, uh, and to make that story really short, it's like basically we're the last ones that don't live in Florida. So we, I call my accountant on June 1st and say, hey, I'm ready to start making my five-year plan to maybe, you know, buy my horse so that I can get, you know, get on the saddle and ride out into the sunshine in the next five year or so years. And he says, great, let's start looking at your books. But and then his next comment was, well, guess what? You know, I have another company that, you know, does what you do. Um, that is looking to purchase somebody. So let me see if I have a conflict of interest. And if not, would you be interested in talking to them? And, you know, my, first of all, my eyes kind of wide open and, you know, it's a little early uh, based on my plan and all that. So I said, sure. And then about 20 days later, uh, after a little bit of brief contact, uh, I had my first meeting with that company and their business brokers. And we had about 20 days of on and off meetings, you know, them gathering details, uh, getting copies of my books, getting the business valuation that my CPA um, produced and, you know, them reviewing everything. And, well, during this exact same time, I do not know how it didn't come from me, but the company, the larger MSP that I partner with called me and said, hey, we're hearing that you're looking to sell. What about us? 
So, you know, that was a big surprise to me. And <laughs> about 10 days later, I sat down and with the three business owners over there and we had lunch um, and basically came to the conclusion that they were very interested as well. So now I have two people working on offers, one that's coming direct from a company I have a really good relationship with. Uh, uh, they're an MSP that's much larger. You know, I'm a solo, was a solo tech, and they have about 50 guys, but I would throw larger clients to them or they would be my backup. If I'm on vacation, they would roll a truck for me in my absence and help me out or do large implementations to the Azure cloud and stuff like that. So I already really had a relationship with that company. So it's about mid-July now, so I call my buddy, who is actually my VoIP provider uh, for all my about 90% of my clients, and I said, hey, guess what? You know, here's what's happening. I got, uh, I called my accountant, and I've got two companies now that want to talk to me about selling to them, and it's about five years too early, I think. And we talked for about 10 minutes, and then he says, John, uh, what about us? I said, you know, we've talked about this in the past, and I said, Oh, I, you know, I didn't realize you're still interested, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you give me 10 days, I'll call you back. So literally 10 days later to the day, to almost to the hour, he calls me back and he says, this is what we'll do. And he gave me a business offer that was exactly what I wanted on paper. I mean, which never happens. You know, usually you got to do the whole used car salesman thing. Right. And the most amazing part is literally five days later, we're signing paper and my business is sold. And, uh, you know, that never happens. And the most amazing part about that might be that, you know, I have a very good relationship with them. You know, I'd say 80 to 90% of my clients already know the guys because they're already providing phone service. And literally uh, the first two weeks, the business owner was on vacation. And the week after that, the main guy uh, that runs the company for him was gone as well. So for, they bought a company that they didn't even run for the first three weeks of buying it. So, you know, that's pretty amazing. And I closed that deal on August 1st. So real quick, as you receive these offers um, for you to kind of mull over, was, and you mentioned that there was an offer that stuck out to you. What made you, you know, as someone's trying to sell their business, they don't, they have no idea. They just want to, you know, usually they'll hear evaluation and they think right. that's what they're going to get. Right. And then there are different ways that you can get that type of money. Can you talk about some of the structures of what have been offered? Maybe not even in these specific deals, but what normally you've seen and what you really wanted to see happen um, from that type of deal. Well, if I start at the beginning with that question, some things that I didn't do that I would recommend somebody that's in their first year of owning their own computer business or technology business or MSP to somebody that's thinking about getting to the point where I was with uh, planning their, their ride out into the sunset is you should be talking about your CPA. And I would suggest they do a business valuation for you every year. You know, particularly to sell your business at the end of the day, uh, every year. I think that's a great metric for two reasons. Um, and let me stick a pin in it right there and say there are a lot of ways to value your business. Uh, your CPA, if you're using QuickBooks or some other software, can, can basically take your books, put it into software that automatically generates uh, you know, the valuations um, for your business. And, and those are all fine and good. Those are a good way to give you a starting point. Some of them are ridiculous. You know, I think one of the valuations for my business uh, based on one of those things was like 15 million. And uh, I'm not kidding. You know, so it's like really, you know, right, right. You know, if somebody offers me that, you know, I'll drive over and pick up the check. You know, so, you know, so you got it. And then one of the valuations was ridiculous, too, uh, on the low end. So, you know, you, it's, it can be a percentage of revenue, two times revenue, three times revenue. Really what it boils down to is what you need as the seller and then what somebody's willing to pay for your business. So it's just like selling your house. You know, you could get to have a two million dollar house. But if somebody's only willing to give you half a million for it, that's what you're going to get for it. So, uh Let's not let's pull the pen out of the other one uh, and say, I like that idea because there's two planning processes. Uh, one that I got lucky on, and it's probably due to the credit of my business manager, my wife, that when we started planning for retirement way back when, we planted, planned our retirement or our walkout based on a zero sum, which means 
we're going to save money like we're not going to get any other money, meaning we're not going to get any money for selling the business. We're not going to get anything from retirement or meaning like, uh, you know, my parents die. I don't know if they'll leave me any money. Her parents, you know, no inheritance of any sort. So we, we are zero base. So we want to be able to walk away if bad things happen and be able to survive. So based on that, the great thing was, you know, that has allowed us to for me to retire about five years early without any worries based on getting the income from my business to supplement the rest of that, which I might need. So, you know, start thinking about what's, what you want to do now. Plan for what you need based on zero sum. And then if you sell your business for 100000 a half a million, a million, 15 million, that's just all bonus money that you, you, know, you might not get count, you know, have counted on. It just makes it even that much sweeter. Sure. Again, normally, like I said, the sale of your business does not happen this quickly. Um, you know, the great thing about it is my VoIP provider already was doing some managed network stuff, was already a G, G Suite or Google Workforce implementer. I had already knew all my clients or at least a good 80 percent of them. So, you know, there were a lot of magic items there that made this go super quick. There was already a lot of, lot of trust between me, the seller and him, the buyer. You know, where basically we just needed something legal and we told our lawyers, look, make it win win for both of us. We trust each other 100 percent. You just get together and write down the legal jargon and we'll sign it. So, you know, there were a lot of things that didn't come into play that might be different with, uh, you know, somebody, a stranger buying your business, sure. uh, which which I didn't have to deal with. Now, originally, you know, to cap off my timeline, you know, my plan is I was going to work for them for two years, possibly maybe three as my business was getting paid off. And if we stick a pin in it there and say, you also have to consider how you're going to get paid for your business. Most of the time, like the first business brokers that came and offered, made an offer to me, it was like, yeah, here's this nice big chunk of money, but here's the caveats. We're going to give you a tiny, tiny little bit of a down payment. And then the rest of it is based on percentages of the clients we keep. And that's how any stranger that's going to buy your business is going to want to look at the deal because they don't want any risk. So they're going to try to push all the risk based on you with no, you know, based on, well, if we only keep two of your 10 clients or a hundred clients or a thousand clients, you know, they're only paying on those two clients, sure. not on the valuation. Um, <laughs> or, and that, that can be fair, but you don't want to absorb all the risk. So, right. you know, when I countered on that one, I said, well, I need a much bigger chunk up front and then we're going to reduce those percentages. All right. And then maybe I stick around longer to make sure those people stay or whatever. So in the end, what happened with me is the company that bought me on December 10th merged with somebody else. So that was a magic day for me when I could kind of say, hey, you know, now they merged with somebody larger. They went from three of us to another group that had about 20, 25 other technicians already. So, you know, I was like, well, you don't need me anymore. Uh, so the great thing is I got paid off for the rest of the money that the company that purchased me for, I got all that money up front and I'm done and I was able to walk away and everybody was super happy. Now I'm still quasi on call with the company that bought me just in case they can't find anything buried in my technical notes or if they need help with a customer. And I've really tried to help them as far as the transition as in calling and talking to clients, explaining them what's going on. Last night, I just drove out and had uh, dinner with an old client to kind of reassure him and make him happy. But overall, the transition's been good. So, you know, the magic in this, and then we'll get into more stuff that might, uh, you know, be of a benefit to people thinking about doing this is from August 1st until today, you know, it's pretty, been a pretty amazing run. You know, I sold my business. You know, and some of this sounds neg negative, but please, it all has a positive twist on it. You know, I sold my business. My mom had a heart attack. My dog died. I sold my parents' home. My parents moved in with us, which has always been a plan. My dad passed. Uh, my wife had a cancer scare. Uh, I was able to retire and com totally complete the sale of my business. We built a house in Florida. Uh, we sold our house. We sold my in-laws' house, who's, which was in the same community, their second home. And now I'm making a cross-country move. So if you think about it, in about five months, all of that has happened, which is 
totally unheard of. And it's all found in place in, like in some sort of magical deal. So, you know, I'm not a huge religious guy, but, you know, I do count my blessings and there's a lot there. So. So there's a lot to unpack on there. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, so I want to take it back all the way to the zero sum conversation Yes. and planning for that. Did you already have an idea of how that would look or did you speak with a financial advisor um, in order to get to that point? And is that the CPA or was that another uh, person to help you with that planning? Um, I would suggest it. It was not our what I would call our money manager or whatever that said the zero sum. It's more of my wife, um, just her and I, I like, and I think I just bought in immediately and didn't give it a second thought that, you know, she said, well, we just need to be able to stand on our own. We can't plan on any inheritance. We can't plan on getting any money from whatever's happening. You know, we just need to start saving now. Okay. So we were, you know, we got lucky, um, you know, even, and I can go way back to when I was in the service, you know, I'm over in the desert or wherever I am on the planet. You know, my dad was, had power of attorney over me and he already started my IRA for my retirement savings when I was in my twenties. So I would suggest, you know, even if you don't have a lot, put a little and start that early because that really gets the bull rolling with that whole compound interest in interest and in all of that. But out of curiosity, then, was it a Roth or a traditional, if you know, uh, back then it was probably a Roth. Okay. Um, if I was in, yeah, definitely a Roth IRA, but you know, then as we got older and got married and all that sort of stuff, we set up the 529 for our daughter to start planning for her school again, got in as to that as early as we could, uh, which has been great. Um, uh, I think we've almost expended that all of those funds and she's got about, uh, oh, about a year left. So that should work out pretty even as far as that goes, which is great. Um, but, you know, I always go back to that. It's her smartest words were, you know, you know, we got to be able to do this on our own, no matter what happens. You know, even if you just quit the business someday and say, I've had enough. Uh, again, go back to your business valuation. I think that's a great metric at the end of the year, because if all of a sudden you run the metrics and uh, your business is worth half it was the year before, I mean, that should throw something up. Or if all of a sudden you had some sort of banner year. Uh, you know, that might be something to consider where you could quit early if you want to get out, if you're burnt out, if you've had enough. Um, and you also want to talk about to your CPA and maybe even a business broker about the things you can do within your business to make it more attractive. Those types of things, which I did not do, but uh, a lot of the companies we're looking for are contracts. Do you have your customers signed for one year or th even three year contracts? So there's guaranteed business or guaranteed revenue for the company purchasing you, you know, what is your debt or expense load? What contracts do you have to fulfill? Meaning, so um, I'm going to pick out a vendor I really like, like Huntress. Uh, do you have an annual contract with them? Are you month to month with these vendors? I really pressed and I think it made me much more attractive with the vendors I had to be month to month with all of those vendors because then who purchased me, it came up in every discussion with everybody that was looking at the Maven group, you know, uh, do you have an annual contract with this, a three-year contract with this, or are you month to month? And I was able to say that I was month to month with every vendor except for one, which really made it attractive to them. So that's another big one. Um, it also gives you a plan when you look at this sort of thing, just to look at your expenses, you know, because a lot of the times, you know, you might find things hidden in there when uh, they do a val business valuation or your CPA would say something to the effect that, um, you know, this doesn't look right because you may be tra expensing everything you can in your business, which you should. But a lot of the times they can make your revenue look a lot lower than it is right. or your profit and loss look a little bit different than it was. So if you're getting close to the time, you know, that's when things get, get moved around and your distributions can change within that. And these are all things that your CPA will guide you on when you get to this point. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> as far as and that and you know and I, how do I want to say this? I can say that the success of my business has been a majority of a lot of the teachings you have gave me early on, and one of those was the monthly conversation, and I think that was one of the critical pieces that I had to change when I had my put up or shut up moment back in uh, 2018 where, you know, a lot of my billing 
was done on either an annual basis, a quarterly basis, my billing for or my um, payments to my vendors were sometimes annual, uh, monthly, they were all across the board. And once I standardize everybody to being monthly and having a standardization of, okay, it needs to be monthly and integrates into this guy. So I don't have to keep chasing my tail to do X, Y, Z to pay these vendors or receive a, uh, a cost that I didn't expect that I had to make a payment for there to throw other things off as well. Then the same thing came in with cash flow. So essentially switching over to a monthly billing allowed improved our cash flow tremendously, which was our main issue. Our main issue was we were making the money. It was just, it wasn't coming in at the right time when other things were coming through as well. So that was really a big eye opener at that point. So it sounds like that obviously was a great pivot or not so much of a pivot, but a great point to make when going through this process. But hitting on the pivoting piece, it also allows you to pivot as well. And, you oh, know, a lot yeah. every, everyone makes fun of John or let me rephrase. Jeff likes to make fun of John a lot that he tried all these vendors and all these things over the past years. And now that joke is starting to fall on me when I was trying to find and figure out the standardization of my stack, which I finally got to that point uh, in these last quarter. But that is a privilege you have being monthly to try out certain things, switch off, switch on, being able to be uh, adjust as necessary so that you can control your cost if you wanted to within 30 days and not be stuck in a three-year contract just because it was a great deal at the time without forecasting and understanding what's going to happen to you personally as a business in the next three years. So that was something um, was very, very important to me and something I wanted to uh, really drive home about on um, you mentioning that. So, well, yeah. I, and I would fight anybody over, you know, well, if I sign for a year, even if you pay monthly and I get a 10% discount or, or whatever the discount, I would fight anybody that that's a good idea uh, for, for a lot of reasons that you mentioned. One, um, you know, totally reduces your risk. Uh, you know, if you're a solo tech, there's a lot more risk there than if you had, you know, it's the company with that. But, you know, let's say something happens to you and at, at the simplest level and you can no longer work, you know, you just turn it all off and you're done. Yep. You know, so that's the thing, you know, reduces your risk incredibly. And you mentioned the point that, uh, well, now, now you can pivot, you know. So uh, a great example maybe in the headlines now would be, you know, Solar Winds Orion. You know, if you paid them for five years, you know, and you're still with them now, you know, I didn't use the Orion product and I don't know what you would pivot to. But if you're month to month, at least you get some options. Right. And the other thing I like is uh, just like my customers you know, the way I treated them is, you know, I didn't have any contracts with my customers. Everything was month to month for 25 years. That's the way I ran because I kind of looked at it, uh, you know, like I have to prove myself to them every month. Well, that's what I want my vendors to do too. You know, if I sign a year or a three year contract with them, they got me, what's their incentive to take care of me. So if I'm month to month and I say, I call up Huntress and I say, Hey, look, I'm thinking of switching to Bob, blah, blah, cause they have this, you know, maybe they'll step up and say, hey, well, we've got that coming. Why don't we support you a free month? Or why don't you just hang in there, which I'd be willing to do because we've got it coming and they've been a great partner. You know, maybe that's what we're going to do. And, and I'm not and I'm not suggesting in any way that you're doing any sort of jumping based on price um, unless it's extreme or, you know, it's a feature you need. So you're switching for a business reason, you know. Um, you know, switching vendors, especially if you have a lot of endpoints, includes a lot of expense there. So, you know, going month to month gives you that flexibility, but it's not, is a, it's not a reason to do that. So, you know, again, a, you know, month to month vendor, I like the idea when they don't force you into that is, hey, we're here every month just like you. We're going to prove that we're worthwhile. So those are the two big reasons I like it. Gotcha. And then <clears throat> as far as your conversation with your CPA, so um, one, for those that don't have a CPA, get one. Um, that is probably going to be one of your first expenses you want to get um, as your. And I want to stop you right there. That's huge. You know, I haven't done this for 25 years. I had a CPA from the beginning. And I think that's, you know, on my top 10 list of why, I've been, why I'm able to be done. You know, I'm not even 50 yet. I'm 49 and a half. So I think that's one of the big reasons that I'm able to be done. 
is I had good CPAs or, or business advisors throughout my 25 years. So that's that's an expense you should take on at the beginning. Yeah. Good point. And, I mean, I think that's it's huge. And, you know, and I can attest to that, that having not having a proper CPA will cause you more problems in the future than it is the you know saving from all those years because i was in a process where i had a tax guy who was doing my books let me rephrase i had a friend who was helping me out with the books and she was great phenomenal able to get all that information and then i had a tax guy that did not pay attention to the details as I would like him have to, to done. And, you know, he claims he had all this experience and things of that nature, and it just didn't work out. And what ended up happening was it wasn't until I got introduced to my current CPA who took a look at the books and said, yeah, this, there, it, it was, he had to unwind essentially that year's books to the point where the previous years we had to decide that we're going to start fresh because that's how bad they were done in the previous um, several years and the filings done from those were done even worse. So through all. And I want to clarify that a little bit, Paco, sure. your CPA should be saying, should not just be doing your taxes at the end of the year and make sure that your stuff looks good for the IRS. Correct. I think the point you're getting at is your CPA should be saying to you a couple of times a year when he's looking at your books, what the hell is that? What are you trying to do there? What is that number? Uh, you know, or and you should be saying to him, well, I want to buy a car, which I'm going to primarily use for business, but I'm going to drive it personally too. what's the best way to do that. And then there should be questions on, you know, you're working for money. You know, anybody that says they don't do this for money, that's ridiculous. You want money. That's the whole idea that you're turning your wrench and doing your technical work. So you want you want to get as much or extract as much money out of your business as you can. So your CPA should be helping you with what are called distributions and setting up your payroll and maybe talking about getting your wife on the payroll. If that looks like an option that pays dividends, if she's helping you in the business. And I'm not saying anything about deception, but there are a lot of, you know, specifically legal ways to get more money out of your business, reduce your tax burden and actually make your books look more attractive. So, you know, that's what your CPA should be doing. It's not just somebody you're handing all your receipts to, you know. Understood. So I think that's the point you're trying to make. Is there should be a business partner just like we are technically right. to our clients. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and, you know, we established our relationship more to the point where he's like our quasi CFO just to understand better on what's happening. And again, I, I, I try to hodgepodge this process and I paid for it, literally paid for it at the end um, to get it all straightened out. But now with 2020, everything's a lot smoother. Everything's all in the right buckets, things of that nature. Um, but exactly like you said, I think it's the biggest point to understand that this is a, a, a function, a role, a service that you have to make sure you pay for. At the bare minimum, make sure you have a bookkeeper because you shouldn't be bookkeeping your own stuff because it's going to be a problem. But you have to make sure at one point in your journey that you have a CPA, an accountant that will be able to help you, you know, just have your books in general straight because when the IRS starts knocking on your door because something got flagged or just you trying to find out your own business growth as well, it's going to be harder for you to do it on your own without any experience for those that don't have experience compared to those that have done this for so many years and they're trying to help make your business more profitable and as John mentioned, getting the most out of your business as well, right? So, yeah, I'll cap that with two things. So, whatever you're paying your CPA, whatever you're paying her, uh, if they're a good CPA, you'll get that money back tenfold, no doubt. Mm -hmm. That's an easy one if they're a good CPA. The other thing is, you mentioned bookkeeper, and that's what my wife did for us. Uh, the best thing about a bookkeeper is that organization. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're spending two hours, a week doing your own books, that's time you could be billing. So I think that's a horrible thing to do. But what bookkeeping gets you is organized. And what I mean by organized is when you look into your books, you should be able to say, uh, what's a great example? This is the amount of money I'm making every month from my Office 365 subscriptions. If you can't say that in QuickBooks really quick, you don't have a good bookkeeping system. That's what that is about. Yeah. Because what's rolling into your book should be classified correctly 
whether you want it that finite from products or if you just want to say this is what I'm making on subscriptions. You know, it doesn't have to be to the nut and bolt if you don't want it to be. It all depends on what kind of how big your organization is. But you should be able to at least to say this is what I'm making off subscriptions or software. Right. This is what I'm making off of hardware. This is what I'm making off of contracts. This is what I'm making off subscriptions. Because that's how you make business decisions. If we want to just get down to the brass tacks, you know, Maybe I shouldn't be selling this because it's a waste of time because I'm actually making almost no money from it. You know, that right. sort of thing. And the biggest piece to including that is ensure you calculate your labor. I know that a lot of one man shops do not. They feel that labor is free and they're like, it doesn't cost me anything to spend my time. And that is a, a comment that I battle multiple times with multiple IT technicians. Yes, it is a resource that you have at your disposal and essentially, quote unquote, unlimited to the amount that you can sleep, you don't get any sleep, but you have to quantify your labor, especially if you have subcontractors or employees as well, which a lot of the business owners should know this. But like for myself, get you know, my ex my expansion happened in a matter of months. So I'm still trying to figure it all out. And, you know, uh, Chris Tim wrote a book. Um, called PSA profitability, which help, you know, he, it's mostly an auto task um, conversation, but uh, our auto task book, but it helps gain a lot of those general principles into anyone else's PSA. But the one piece he mentioned that a lot of IT support companies do not have is they don't determine their burden rate. And the burden rate is essentially the time it costs a, um, a, the business of what that tech does. So how much per hour is this employee calling you, costing you? And is that attached to all the so service offerings and the service offerings that you're offering? So like your hourly rate, your managed services, things of that nature, are you profitable? And are you not only profitable, are you making a healthy margin? So these are all things to consider um, and figuring that piece out, but ensure you calculate your labor and understand, and this is something that, you know, I had to educate a, a couple of friends as well who are solopreneurs, where what the business makes is not what you make. Like there's a concept that you are the business. And if you want to operate that way, you're an IT consultant. You're not a business, in my opinion. You, if you want to identify and separate the two and you've registered as an entity, the business makes the money and the business is paying you. It's just like you working at a job where you know, they're paying you a check. They're not paying you everything they're making off of you, but they're making you a soluble wage that they feel you're worth slash are generating for them. And it's up to you to decide if that's enough or how do you make more? So that's how that all kind of works out. I know in the beginning, it's kind of blurred when you're trying to start out and everything is kind of coming in and you spend it out and kind of figure that way. But as you start to legitimize, form your business, even on the beginning front of it, you have to understand those two pieces as well. And that's a great point too, based on your burden rates and all that. It's, that's kind of where the magic happens. And what gets me excited when I look at those numbers is, you know, that's where you look into, well, where's, where are my heaviest burdens that are hurting my margins? Because that's a great place to start with automation and looking into how your PSA or how your RMM or, or your business processes can reduce that burden and maybe remove employees from having to do that uh, if possible. Or that's a signal to say, hey, we are not charging nearly enough for, you know, how, how heavy this burden is um, on our business. And also keep in mind, you know, uh, your business does not need to show a profit per se to be a valuable entity to purchase by somebody else. Somebody that's buying your business that uh, that may have zero profit but looks into your books and sees your distributions and payrolls to a solo solopreneur because you've pulled all that money out. I mean, they understand what they're looking at. So you can have a zero profit business that is generating a ton of revenue that is just simply leaving the business to be distributed somewhere else. So, you know, that again is what a CPO will guide you on. And, you know, somebody that's looking at your books, you know, you don't have to have millions of dollars sitting in your business doing nothing. You know, as a solo solopreneur, you want that money back in your books working for you. So just two points of what you said. So it's funny that you say that, too, because um, in my mind, <clears throat> I if once I do decide to sell, it's more of a I want to make sure that it I leave it profitable and I still have a lot more 
um, to do. I do have a date in mind of when my exit will be. Um, but, you know, it's amazing on how uh, your company will gain attention to these type of offers as well. So like, I think I kind of told you as you were kind of going through your thing, when I made that ch the channel futures list, I'm getting two to three emails a, a week from different private equity companies, other CPAs, other MSPs mm -hmm. that are trying to expand their foot, a footnote in Chicago. Um, and I think it's just more of my location because I am in downtown Chicago, you know, versus like other of my peers are say that they're in Chicago, but they're in neighboring areas um, or neighboring suburbs, um, things like that, where it's like, I'm just not ready because in my head, I feel like, okay, I should be at a bigger margin cost or a bigger profit rate to have something worth it. But as you just mentioned, that's not the case all the time. So. Well, one of the primary evaluations is just a multiple of your revenue. It doesn't take into account much of anything else. It could be two or three times the revenue, depending even more, possibly less based on the industry. So, you know, if you just said, well, we're going to do two times your million dollars a year revenue, that's two million. So, you know, and but there might not be $2 million in your business. That's purely a revenue number. Then they look into the books and, you know, look at the sustainability and all that and what is happening to that revenue. So, you know, it doesn't have anything really to do about the business's profitability because as you mentioned, Baco, that money is flowing hopefully into your pockets to, uh, you know, satisfy your needs, meaning take care of your retirement, pay for your house, you know, do all that. You want that money working for you, not just blindly sitting in the business. So, Obviously, you should always have some cash reserves in your business as possible sure. to uh, for the rainy day fund or Murphy's Law. But, uh, you know, a lot of times you'd rather have that. Business. And you can always distribute it back to your business through a loan or something like that as needed. So exactly. So to shift gears a little bit, I think mm -hmm. we had a lot of great information on that. But kind of for you, you know, now that you are no longer an IT support or an IT business owner, you're not a in the in a managed service provider. <laughs> what now, short term and long term, will John Dubinsky be doing? Uh, you know, I'm going to do some of the things that I've always maybe thought about uh, doing technology wise when I was an MSP. You know, I'm going to minimize my technology footprint. Like I don't even own a computer anymore. So I'm talking to you on my Note 10 Plus using Samsung Dex. Uh, using the camera on my phone, you know, I always something to see how simplistic I can make my technology footprint, but still allow me to do everything I want. I've been having a lot of fun with that, getting a little bit more uh, basic home automation. I haven't done a lot with that since I'm actually vacating this home probably in the next two weeks. Uh, maybe focus a little bit more on my health. Uh, you know, obviously working 10 hour days back in the MSP, which, you know, that sounds like a negative, but I really love that. Um, and that was probably one of the, my biggest transitions of being extremely busy all day to figure out what I want to do all day. Uh, you know, so that has been interesting and fun. Uh, focus on family and friends a little bit more. I'm going to move into Florida, so I'm going to spend some time with the mouse. We really like doing that is, I mean, Disney, if nobody knows what that means, uh, <laughs> we like to do that. Uh, I want to really try, I'm, I'm going to try on being bored. I'd like to be bored just to see what it's like for a little bit. Uh, and then I'm going to hunt down Mike Smith and uh, Marvin B. down there and bug them as much as I can and, and just show up on their doorstep or surprise them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, long term, I, I imagine I might get bored. I don't know. You know, I've got a couple of buddies that are already retired as well, some from the military and some from uh, selling their businesses early as well, too. Uh, and, and it's a mix for them. Some of them are extremely bored and don't like it. Uh, some of them are living the life. So, you know, I don't know where I'll fit into that. Um, I have had a job offer in our industry and out of our industry all, already. Um, I have some friends down there that do something out of our industry that they want me to get involved in. You know, I'm not going to rush into anything. I, I, if I had to honestly choose, I would probably not go back to IT. You know, if somebody needed a remote tech maybe a couple days a week and I was bored, I would probably definitely jump, jump on that or look into that. But, you know, for the next couple of months, I get to get my family down there and get situated and all that. But, Short term, long term, you know, I'm going to try to get sunburned and be bored for a little bit and we'll move on from there. Yeah, that's uh, definitely interesting. Um, you know, I've done my time. I did my 25 years. I've paid the ward and I've paid the price, I think. I'm, I'm <laughs> lucky to be uh, uh, doing this as young as I am, I feel. You know, I'm still young enough to go out and play a little bit. But, you know, I still have a little bit of that entrepreneurial spirit, too. So we'll see what happens. Sure. I mean, I think also, too, I think 
you probably got out at a great time at the tail end of everything that's happening in our industry. So that's a lot less, you know, uh, stress to deal with and trying to figure out what's going to be the best way to protect our clients too, which is a whole new game. You know, that's a funny comment because, you know, having the, uh, uh, having the fortune of being able to look back over 25 years, you, it has changed a lot. And it has definitely changed a lot over the last five years, you know, with compliance, mm -hmm. a lot more security issues. And that was maybe one of the primary reasons that I sold early is that I wanted to be part of a team because it literally was just getting too much maybe for me to do totally alone. You know, uh, there's just so much to watch now and so much to be aware of in order to do it right for your clients. Um, if you're in compliance driven, you know, I was in a lot of uh, dental, so healthcare. you know, if you're in that, there's just a lot to keep, to keep your eyes on there to make sure that, you know, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So it's nice to maybe have somebody that can go do something of the more turn the wrench stuff and you can be more of a, what I want to say, a security type officer. I'm not saying that in any way I was any sort of uh what do they call it? I'm missing out, you know, totally security for M M M S S P, mm. which, you know, there's a lot more to watch with firewall logs and firewalls and security and compliance and okay. trying to instruct clients to do the right thing. And, you know, the biggest fight I probably had to drag this conversation on a little longer is, you know, a lot of my clients were with me 20 of those 25 years, if not longer, you know, I watched their kids grow up, that sort of thing. But, you know, the change for them is, John, it was working before. Why do we need to do this now? So, you know, there's a lot of that that, you know, was the combat or the message that I had to try to change to uh, move them into what, it, you know, is modern IT versus uh, break fix IT. So. And how, and how has that and then we'll take a quick break real quick. Um, the personal side of that, you know, the relationships you built with these client with your clients, how has that how have you been addressing that as much as possible? Um, have you tried to meet whoever you can um, after so point in time? Did you shoot them a note? Uh, did you drop by for those that really made an impact in your career slash had a presence in your life? Uh, well, there's twofold there. Uh, one, the company that bought me and when they merged, they did a really good job. So the two, the main, pr the primary business owner and then the, what I would call the president of the company actually went and called individually every one of my business owners, my customers and said, you know, you got the inter you've got the email about what's happening. You know, I'm calling you. Do you have any questions? Do you have any concerns? You know, nothing's going to change. Your billing staying the same. Do you have any problems? Here's my personal number, my personal email. Call me. Uh, you know, the, the guys from Blackboard who bought me originally are just good guys. So even if they were to break up with one of the clients, they're the kind of guys that would be like, well, we're going to break up, but we're going to break up as friends. You know, so I really know my clients are in good shape. And then I kind of let them give me a direction. On, well, who do you think I should reach out to from that would benefit you? I mean, like somebody that had a lot of concerns, wanted to really know what was going on with me or blah, blah, blah. I was happy to reach out. Like I said, I had dinner with one of those clients last night. And I also sent out a personal email explaining to everybody what happened and maybe had a couple like off the record conversations with a few that would said, well, you know, off the record, you know, if I was just leaving because I won the lotto and, you know, none of this was happening, you know, this, I would still tell you to use them because, you know, there would be the ones that I would recommend you to go with anyways. And then my final point of interest was that was, well, if you're not happy, just call them. And if you can't resolve it, you know, they're just like the conversations we have, you know, you're going to part as friends if, if you want it to be that way. So, you know, that that, again, is another really key benefit that may not happen with everybody that goes through this process. You know, I was dealing with somebody that I already knew had the same business philosophy as me. So that was a little bit of magic in there as well. Very cool. Very cool. Um, we're going to take a quick break um, and then we'll just uh, gather some final thoughts and kind of discuss uh, some other things, John Dubinsky and, you know, everything to do with uh, kind of what we discussed today. But if you would like to support the show, go to patreon.com slash MSP unplugged. Um, there you can sponsor us. The shows cost about a buck a show. And basically it allows you a couple things. It allows you to have some first input, first information and top, top of mind when it comes to anything being done in MSP unplugged and how do you get to, 
have a better input? How do you have more engagement with us? Well, we allow you to go into our uh, super secret Facebook group is like Jeff likes to call it, but we have a private Facebook group for MSP Unplugged for those that have sponsored or purchased a ticket for TechCon Unplugged. Um, we allow those uh, 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 maintain a, a private group. We're about close to 200 people now, or I should say closer to 160 and really great group. Um, and the reason why we decided on a private Facebook group is because we've seen and been in part of a lot of Facebook groups that are out there. Unfortunately, a lot of them have the same trend where there are IT business owners, techs that believe their opinion is fact and very opinionated to call someone else's question dumb, stupid, um, why are you asking that uh, situation? You know, you should, you should already know this if you're in this field. And we feel that there are no dumb questions um, there is an ability to understand that, you know, you, we all had to learn in one way, shape or form. And there are a lot of techs and IT business owners starting out or in the middle of things. Maybe there was an area that they never had a concentration in and they don't feel comfortable now being able to ask that in a public forum. So we created this group. We get a lot of great traction. Um, there's a lot of great key members in there. Kurt being one of them, uh, in the, ch uh, in the chat right now, Kyle Kenyon, um, a lot of great guys in there just really uh, uh, providing effort, really trying to provide value. And again, it's two way. So not only can you ask questions, but you can provide your viewpoints and your experience as well. Because as we have mentioned, even back in our early days, no matter where you are in your journey, we all can learn something from everyone. So um, if you're interested, again, head over to uh, patreon.com slash MSP unplugged. And we look forward to seeing you there. And then just a side note, me and Jeff, again, we keep teasing it. We are going to make a more dedicated effort where we are expanding the community forum. So we are working on another platform to possibly bring off from the Facebook group. Um, but that is hopefully um, going to be here toward the end of the quarter, probably next quarter, if we really dive down to it. But as you can imagine, conference planning and trying to get that all sorted out, um, we're going to do as best as we can, but fingers crossed. So, all right. And you are muted, John, if you're talking. <laughs> First time. Sorry about that. No worries. First time. Uh, you know, if you guys don't get your act together, I might actually have to get back on Facebook so I can get back in that community. We all know you will never join Facebook again, but that is a nice gesture. I am extremely tempted for that reason only. Now that I have a lot more time, maybe that I can spend in that group. But, you know, I want to <laughs> scroll back. You know, there's a few people in the chat. You know, Alan Miller made a great... Uh, uh, point about uh, burden costs. Um, keep in mind that there are some standard industry burden costs that your CPA can apply to your numbers if you don't track. So that's a good way or something to talk to them about too. If you're not tracking that, they can, you know, push those expenses on your numbers so that you might get a more realistic view about what is actually happening in your business. Um, and yeah, Kevin, I see, I don't know what the heck uh, uh, Paco's drinking either. It's green and kind of nasty, but, uh, and then a shout out to Kurt S. I see you out there too. Long time, Kurt. See you. Yeah, so I'm drinking a green smoothie prepared to me by uh, my amazing girlfriend who is trying to help me get back in uh, better health. So we are on, uh, I think it's power greens, mango, grapes, uh, with a little bit of cayenne pepper for a little kick. Um, so I'm also focusing on my health as well. Um, she was, she purchased some, uh, spin shoes for me for our Peloton bike or her Peloton bikes, I should say that's in our home. So I've been doing that for the next, last couple of weeks as well. So she's trying to, you know, trying to keep, uh, me healthy and going along as well. So also trying to make the, the health, uh, move this year as well. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're already at the, close to the top of the hour by about a minute. I mean, I'm sure this is probably a shock for a lot of people to who are just first now hearing about this, that, you know, you're, you sold your business, no longer uh, the Maven group. Um, a lot of great information on selling your business, acquisitions, things of that nature. Um, but as we kind of leave off, I think, you know, my question would be, is there a moment or a memory or a theme that, you're really going to miss running an IT business. And then we're basically, um, we'll be able to catch you when we uh, see you next time. Uh, 
I, I would suggest the primary thing that if I look back over my 25 years is uh, pr- conduct your business with no regrets, meaning, uh, you know, I always had this little math problem that we've talked about on other shows that, you know, doing what is best for me we always ended up what was best for my client as long as I did that with integrity and honesty and with their best interests in mind, meaning getting the best products to service myself so I could service them. Uh, you know, trying to conduct myself in a way that uh, made their businesses better and made my business the most profitable, you know, because now I can look back over 25 years and say, hey, I, I, you know, I did the best I could. It might have not always worked out perfectly, but and even when I stumbled, you know, I was able to pick things up that, you know, uh, I did never deceive anybody or, or, or step off that track. You know, I always tried to do the best I could do. So, you know, that's the one thing. Just try to conduct the, you know, yourself and your business in the best way possible so that when you are done, you can look back and say, hey, that was great. Uh, as far as where you're going to find me, well, if you guys don't get this new community up and running, I'll probably be on Facebook. So watch for me in the group. Uh, you know, I would hate to say that, but <laughs> I, I am definitely interested in getting uh, back in touch with a lot of the guys, especially now that I have more time and gals for that matter. Uh, you know, so stand by. I'm sure I'll try to bug you guys and be on another show if I can add any sort of value along the way. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward maybe to be closer to Mike and uh, Marvin down there. So maybe they'll be gracious enough to let me uh, rock a microphone down there as well. So that's about it. Very cool. And then we will be seeing you at TechCon? Absolutely. I'm totally planning on it. I'm stoked. I'm already uh, sort of planning a trip up back up, a driving trip back up to hit the East Coast, coming through Pennsylvania and seeing some buddies and, you know, driving through Michigan, seeing some people and then ended up uh, up there at TechCon Unplugged. So, uh, you know, buy your ticket now. It's fully refundable. So I don't know why you wouldn't. Um, I'd hate to miss you guys if you if we get to that threshold of a capacity. So that's just going to be great to reconnect with a lot of people. And it might be nice to do a conference and not have to answer any tickets during the conference. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to that. <laughs> so you make a great point. Um, you know, and we talked about this too. Have you yet taken a vacation where you can be fully unplugged yet? Or is that still to come? That is still to come. Uh, We were going to go to Disney World down in Florida here at the beginning of January, which would have been my first vacation in 25 years uh, being unplugged. And that sounds really bad, but keep in mind that I've had a lot of great vacations and have worked out some systems all that. But I've always had to have maybe one eye, you know, kind of looking at the ticket system and managing. Uh, that didn't happen just basically based on our move date getting moved around and everything else that happened in that laundry list of stuff that I regurgitated. Um, you know, now it's just going to be able to be able to sit by the phone, have the phone uh, pool and turn the phone off and uh, fall asleep without having to worry. it. So at some point I'll hit a vacation and do that. I am looking forward to that. That'll be a little bit weird, but uh, yeah, that's just another blessing on the list. I hear you. I hear you. Well, I mean, I think from, personally from me and especially from the community uh, we appreciate all that you have, you know, dedicated to us. And I know you'll still be around you, you know, you'll be uh, we've discussed on uh, how to be more involved with the podcast and some things in the background as well. But personally for me, I want to thank you for everything that you've done personally for myself, because again, you know, and I am very open about this on every chance I get that you have had a very instrumental piece in my success over the last several years. So appreciate to have you as not only a colleague, as someone that I can bounce ideas from, but as not only a great friend, but as a brother as well. So I appreciate everything you've done and many uh, blessings and luck to you as you continue your journey. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Now that I'm kind of like the old guy at the club, you know, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, the community, you know, not only MSB Unplugged, Podnuts, Podnuts Pro, you know, all of those guys and gals that, you know, really, if you really think about it, is all of us together that have got to me, got me to where I'm at. I mean, there's been a lot of people that through simple, small recommendations to actually turning riches with me. You've been there, you know, where we've gone on service calls together that have, uh, you know, contributed, if not even uh, accelerated my success. So, you know, if I were to sit down and make a, you know, I'd be here for days making a list that uh, have gotten me to this point of people that have helped along the way. So really, you know, it's one of those things, the more you give, the more that gives back. So, you know, I appreciate just the opportunity to do that. And I feel the same way about you, Paco. Thank you very much. 
Appreciate it. Yeah. And then, like I said, you know, I will make sure to head up there one last time before you take yeah, off party on. You know, sunny sunshine state of Florida. But um, again, appreciate everything you've done. So um, with that, you know, we will go ahead and, and, and close out the show. If you want to watch live and hang out in the chat room over at youtube.com slash MSP unplugged, subscribe and hit that notification button so you never miss an episode. Um, we will be having our normal episode on Friday. Uh, we will be having Keeper Security uh, password management on as well, um, working out the details on there. But I believe we'll be having their chief revenue officer on who helps dedicate his efforts in the MSP space. So that'll be a great conversation. And I know this was a vendor that was a big request from our community. So we're happy to have them on on Friday here. So um, if you're unable to catch it on YouTube or unable to watch us live, use your favorite podcasting app to take us wherever you happen to go in the car shower like jeff likes to do on your morning walks things of that nature but as always we thank you for listening we will see you next time on msp unplugged <laughs>